Hey everyone, Ross here with a little bit of housekeeping before we start. I've had some comments on some of the videos I've made about not being able to find the show on Apple Podcasts and iTunes and whatnot, and now I can happily say that I was only doing my job is now on the Apple platform. So tell your friends, in fact, leave a review or a comment. It really helps me out. Also, there's going to be a change in format going forward. All future episodes are going to be released on a bi-weekly instead of weekly basis. This just gives me a bit more time to polish and record these episodes. Now that's all been taken care of, let's get started. He was an officer from a distinguished naval family and saw extensive service in the Royal Australian Navy during both the Second World War and the Korean War, and for his work was rewarded the prestigious Distinguished Service Cross on three separate occasions. Get ready to come aboard the story of Commander Warwick Seymour Bracegirdle. Welcome to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast. I'm Ross Manuel, I'm an amateur historian and writer, and on this week's episode, I look into the life, service, and legacy of Naval Officer Commander Warwick Seymour Bracegirdle, DSC, and two bars, who served in the Royal Australian Navy during both the Second World War and the Korean War. Warwick Seymour Bracegirdle was born on the 22nd of December, 1911, in the family home in High Street, Newcastle, New South Wales, to Rear Admiral Sir Leighton Seymour Bracegirdle and his wife, Lady Lillian Anne. Warwick was the eldest of two sons and was educated in Melbourne Grammar School during 1918-1919 and 1923-1924, at St Peter's College Adelaide during 1919-21, and Cranbrook School Sydney during 1921-22. This is mainly due to the family moving constantly to follow his father's naval career. It seems without saying that Warwick was destined for a naval career. Uh, the Rear Admiral uh, had been an officer in the New South Wales Naval Brigade and later the Royal Australian Navy since 1898. And by the time he was 21, he had fought in the Boxer Rebellion and the Boer War. And in the First World War, he served in the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force that occupied German New Guinea and in 1915 was appointed to command the Australian Naval Bridging Train. It was a relatively small unit comprised of Royal Australian Naval Reserve ratings and officers intended to serve as a mounted engineering unit in a manner very similar to the construction battalions made famous by the US Navy in the Second World War. Following this tradition, young Warwick entered the Royal Australian Naval College in Jervis Bay in February 1925 as a cadet midshipman. He graduated in 1928 with sporting colours for rugby and hockey and was the winner of the welterweight boxing competition. He was an average scholar but he was nevertheless awarded the King's Gold Medal for exemplary conduct, performance of duty and good influence amongst his peers. He was promoted to midshipman in May 1929 while serving on HMAS Australia 2. As was customary at the time, Warwick commenced training with the Royal Navy in early 1930, serving aboard the HMS Ramillies in the Mediterranean fleet, and then also was the midshipman's welterweight boxing champion. He was promoted to sub-lieutenant in September 1931 and studied at Greenwich Royal Naval College. He struggled with these academic subjects on the course, and he failed a number of them in 1932, but repeated then completed the course in 1933. He joined the destroyer HMAS Stewart in 1933 and was promoted to lieutenant in 1934 and gained his watchkeeping certificate. In December 1935, he joined the crew of the heavy cruiser HMAS Canberra. He completed the long gunnery course in England during the period of 37 to 38 and joined the light cruiser HMS Amphion in preparation for a transfer to the Royal Australian Navy. On the 10th of June 1939, at the Greenwich Naval College Chapel, he married Margaret Eve Slingsby Bethel. They would later have two sons, Simon and Nicholas, and a daughter, Philada. They would be known socially as the Bracelets. When the Amphion was commissioned as HMAS Perth, Bracegirdle joined as a gunnery officer on the 10th of July 1939, after a short honeymoon. After the outbreak of the Second World War, Perth served in the North Atlantic and Caribbean theatres before returning to Australia in mid-1940. During the latter half of the year, the cruiser deployed to the Mediterranean and was involved in the Battle of Matapan, on the 28th of March 1941 and participated in the evacuation of Commonwealth troops from Greece and Crete in April-May that year. Brace Girdle was awarded his first Distinguished Service Cross, or DSC, for wholehearted devotion to duty and high personal courage, particularly during the air raids on Preas, Greece, while under air attack when he noticed an ammunition lighter, the Clan Fraser, alongside a burning merchant ship. Realising that if it, it caught fire it would destroy the port, he rode furiously over across the harbour and began towing the lighter away. 
When it did eventually explode, it nearly killed Bryce Girdle and another officer. When the merchant ship exploded, he was swamped by a wave and sucked deep underwater. When he emerged, he was covered in thick oil, while the ammunition sank harmlessly to the harbour floor. Following this, on the 23rd of November 1941, he was appointed to the shore installation HMAS Cerberus as a temporary officer in charge of the gunnery school. Promoted to Lieutenant Commander in December 1942, he joined the heavy cruiser HMAS Shropshire as a gunnery officer. During the next two and a half years, he saw service in New Guinea and the Philippines campaigns. On the 25th of October 1944, during the Battle of Surigo Strait, HMAS Shropshire fired over 240 8-inch shells as part of a US Navy task group contributed to the destruction of the Japanese battleship Yamashiro. Brace Girdle was awarded a bar to his DSC on the 27th of March 1945 and twice mentioned in dispatches on the 1st of January and 1st of May that year. For those unaware, a bar is a second decoration of the same type. He was highly regarded by the ship's company who described him as a great one-eyed gunnery officer, never failing in his enthusiasm, who had a significant effect on the training and devotion to duty of the men underneath him. His personal reports, however, told a different story. Captain John Collins, the commanding officer of the Shropshire, stated that he was not an agile brain and rapidly changing situations were rather bewildering to him. However, he plods on and gets things sorted out eventually. The constants throughout his, all his reports were his outstanding social skills, his love of the Navy, a selfless attitude, particularly in combat, and his genuine concern for the men under his command. One report described him as a breezy, cheery type for whom the troops will do anything. Brace Girdle returned to the gunnery school in May 1945 and was promoted to commander in June 47. When the family moved to England in February 1948, Warwick completed the Joint Services Staff Course, which was followed by his secondment to the British Combined Operations Headquarters and the Operations Division in the Admiralty. On returning to Australia, he took command of the destroyer HMAS Bataan in late 1951 and took her to the Korean War between February and August 1952. Bataan operated in poorly charted waters and conducted frequent naval bombardments of North Korean positions in support of Australian forces. Early in her deployment, she was hit by a single enemy shell, which caused minor damage. However, it did destroy his uh, dress uniform that was hanging in his cabin, much to the enjoyment of his men. The sails under him recalled him with respect and admiration, with war correspondent Ronald McKee describing him as a big, ruddy, cheerful-looking man with smooth black hair and one of those deceptive, innocent English schoolboy faces. His peers considered him to be an actor, who had a winning personal style which greatly contributed to his success in command. At one point, the naval board chastised him for using excessive amounts of ammunition in his shore bombardments, which Brace Girdle claimed that the ammunition was almost out of date and was better to fire it at the enemy than dump it into the sea. For his Korean War service, Brace Girdle was awarded a second bar to his DSC and an officer degree of the United States Legion of Merit, an award in the United States Armed Forces System of Awards that is given for exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding services and achievements. Upon returning to Australia, he took the opportunity to take his two sons to sea on Bataan for exercises off the East Coast and in the Bass Strait. He would relinquish command of Bataan in 1953 and spent the next year as Director of Training and Staff Requirements at the Naval Office in Melbourne. The family then travelled to England where Warwick took up duties as the Royal Australian Navy's Liaison Officer within the United Kingdom's Joint Services Staff. His tenure ended in 1956 and at the age of 45, with no prospects of being promoted to Captain, he resigned from the Royal Australian Navy on the 14th of February 1957. The Brace Girdles remained in Britain and Warwick was employed initially at the Morgan Crucibles Company, London, for joining the National Iranian Oil Company, based in Abadan, as a training specialist. His family did not accompany him to Iran. The Brace Girdle marriage became strained by the separation, and at the Winchester County Court on the 5th of August 1969, Warwick and Margaret were granted a divorce. In a peculiar sequence of events, less than a month later, Warwick married German divorcee Pauline Polly Anels Maria Kaspar at the Gosport Registration Office, Hampshire, on the 20th of September, 1969. Warwick worked briefly for Vosper Thornycroft Shipbuilders in the 1970s before retirement and setting up at Lodge Cottage in Gislingham, Suffolk. Known as Braces, he was the typical gunnery officer of his era, hardworking and brave, but also highly respected by his men. He was frequently visited by shipmates from Perth, Sydney and Bataan. Warwick Seymour Bracegirdle, DSC and two bars, 
died of a myocardial infarction and atherosclerosis at his home in the 14th of March, 1993, at the age of 82, and was buried at St. Mary's Churchyard in Gislingham, Suffolk. A memorial service was also held in Australia at the Naval Chapel in Garden Island, Sydney, for his family, friends, and many admirers. He was survived by his first and second wives, the three children from his first marriage, his younger brother, L- Brian Leighton Bracegirdle, who was born in Melbourne in 1918 and served as a squadron leader in the Royal Australian Air Force during the Second World War, and later in the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, otherwise known as ASIO. Warwick's eldest son, Simon, became a music teacher and had a long-term career within the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Nicholas joined the Royal Navy and reached the rank of Lieutenant Commander and, and saw action during the 1982 Falklands War. Falada migrated to Greece and became a professional tour guide. For a man who spent his adult life at sea or in sea-related pursuits, it almost seems fitting that he would die in his bed at the age of 82 of a heart condition. But when he did go to take his watch in the great beyond, he did so with the utmost respect of his brother sailors. And while he may not have had the career his father had, his service to his country during two global conflicts cannot be discounted, and for that we are eternally grateful. And there you have it, the story of Commander Warwick Seymour Bracegirdle, Distinguished Service Cross and Two Bars. Next time on the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, she was an adventurer and mountain climber who refused to let her gender get in the way of serving her mother country. She financed her own ambulance called Ella the Elephant and served with a distinction in Belgium and France before coming to her own in Serbia on the Macedonian front. Next time on I Was Only Doing My Job, I look into the life, service, and legacy of Sergeant Olive May Kelso King. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. I would really appreciate it and would help out the show if you would share this or leave a comment on Spotify or Google Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts as it really helps others find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode with photos, show notes and transcripts, head over to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram. Don't worry, there'll be a link in the description. If you want to follow me for more history hijinks and random nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at at Doc Winters. Once again, my name is Ross. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.